So today's guest is Professor Keith Ricks. Uh, Keith Ricks' involvement in the forensic field began in the 1960s when unusually he lived in hostels in London with people who'd previously offended whilst assessing people in prison for hostel admission. Whilst a senior lecturer in psychiatry in Leeds, he became a visiting consultant psychiatrist to HMP Leeds and established the Leeds Magistrates Court Mental Health Assessment and Diversion Scheme and the City's Forensic Psychiatry Service. He's provided expert evidence to courts and tribunals for almost 40 years, including on a pro bono basis in capital cases in the Caribbean and Africa. He's the editor of a handbook for trainee psychiatrists and co-editor of Rix's Expert Psychiatric Evidence. He's visiting professor of medical jurisprudence at University of Chester, honorary consultant forensic psychiatrist with Norfolk and Suffolk Foundation Trust and mental health and intellectual disability lead for the Faculty of Forensic and Legal Medicine of the Royal College of Physicians. And Keith, I met you about 20 years ago when you helpfully advised me not to allow prisons to stick me in visits when assessing people for courts, which was which was good advice, but really great to get the chance to meet with you and have another conversation with you today. Yes, thank you. Um, that, that was an interesting piece of advice because uh, I am now unable to follow that advice myself. Um, and the next time uh, I go to prison and have to go into legal visits, uh, I'll think back to uh, that, that advice which I gave you, which was very good advice at the time, but it's just no longer uh, possible uh, to follow it. Uh, and I think it's unfortunate that uh, when uh, um, experts do uh, go into uh, prisons uh, that uh, in, in particular healthcare experts who are used to uh, working in a healthcare environment uh, uh, liaising with other healthcare professionals uh, that uh, they have to see the prisoner in legal visits and they're denied the opportunity to talk with healthcare staff who uh, may well know the uh, prisoner, and as we did in those days, to uh, simply look through the paper uh, inmate uh, medical record. Hello, Keith. It's really nice to, to meet you. I was fascinated to see that um, way back in the 60s, you'd lived um, in hostels whilst uh, undertaking assessments. Um, and I was really interested to know, know a bit more about that what kind of places because there wasn't a lot around in those they were Norman houses I suppose there was the Salvation Army hostels I worked in Simon community hostels what sort of places were you hanging around in? Right it's interesting you say Simon community because um, uh, this may be too long an account uh, for, for the podcast but I think it's it's worth explaining how I came to be in those hostels. Uh, I had wanted to, um, I'd always liked uh, being in London and uh, in my six week summer holiday between O levels and A levels, uh, I got myself a job at the general register office at Somerset House uh, because I thought that would uh, help me research my family history. And uh, I, uh, found accommodation through a Methodist mission that advertised on the back of the Methodist recorder, which my parents received uh, into the house each week. Uh, and the uh, Methodist minister there, a man called James Martin, a man who had uh, entered the Methodist ministry uh, after recovering from alcohol dependence uh, 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 when he was uh, uh, working as the managing director of a shipping company in Singapore, as I recall it, uh, he uh, offered uh, me a place uh, in a building that he was using to store furniture uh, for uh, a hostel that he was planning to open. Several years later, uh, that building was indeed one of the hostels uh, in which I live. Uh, but uh, unlike the other uh, Methodist ministers who had similar missions in London, uh, he said he wouldn't charge me anything for uh, uh, the corner uh, of the, uh, was it, well, the furniture store, 
all he expected of me was to look after the, uh, keep an eye on the building. So I suppose uh, I could even put on my CV that I've worked in security. Um, one night uh, he said he would take me out and show me the work that he was doing. And we'd only got 50 or 100 yards along the Bow Road when he stopped the car. Uh, there was a man lying comatose in the shop doorway. Uh, he got me to help him uh, drag this man into the car. Uh, we then drove uh, west uh, in uh, towards uh, uh, London and uh, stopped at the London Hospital, uh, dragged this man up the steep steps to the A&D department, which was then at the front of the uh, building. Uh, sister came out and uh, said that she wasn't having uh, him in her A&D department. So we dragged him back down the steps and then into uh, Stepney, uh, where uh, James Martin had first been a minister uh, after he was ordained, stopped uh, on a street corner at what I thought was a derelict house. Uh, he knocked on the door. It was opened by um, uh, what I would say in those days were long haired students with sandals. And this was uh, a um, shelter for uh, homeless uh, people, alcohol dependent people, ex offenders, and so on, run by the Simon community, which uh, only a couple of years later became the Cyrenians. And uh, uh, that uh, experience uh, led me to decide to pursue medicine, not as I had originally intended in order to be a forensic pathologist, uh, but uh, in order to uh, work with the living rather than dead, the dead. And inevitably, although I thought about neurology, uh, a discipline in which there's a lot of alcohol related um, morbidity, uh, I then ended up in psychiatry. Uh, the subsequent years, um, I went uh, uh, back in uh, school holidays and then in university vacations. And although the next year I worked as a typist for uh, London Transport, uh, after that, uh, I would simply go and work for uh, the, the Methodist mission. And that's how uh, I found myself going into uh, Pentonville prison. Uh, it's interesting how times change uh, with several packets of cigarettes in order to uh, engage uh, with the prisoners and to find out uh, what they thought about going and living in one of uh, James Martin's hostels uh, when they were released. Yeah, that's a fascinating uh, account, really, of uh, that early experiential learning that you had and so many of my friends and contacts have followed a similar kind of path. I don't think it would happen uh, now because we all went into doing these works without any checkups or police vetting or anything like that and it was a, all a bit uh, wild but clearly from what you're saying it was it was an experience which altered your pathway through through life. Yes. So you've already told us, in fact, what attracted you to forensic work. But can you say a bit more about about that? Yes. Uh, the, my original uh, plan, uh, having been diverted in the way I describe. Uh, was to work in the uh, alcohol uh, field. And uh, uh, as a medical student, uh, I, I was involved in setting up the Aberdeen Council on uh, Alcohol. I was a medical student in Aberdeen. And uh, uh, that the alcohol uh, uh, element was a thread throughout uh, my time as a medical student and through my training in uh, psychiatry. Uh, but 
uh, my first consultant appointment uh, was as a liaison psychiatrist in uh, Leeds. It was a, the attraction for me was that it was a, uh, a very uh, strictly combined academic and NHS appointment. It was meant to be half and half. Uh, of course it wasn't and the uh, clinical demands uh, overwhelmed the uh, academic work. But uh, as part of my higher training in Manchester, uh, where I had been a lecturer in psychiatry and an honorary senior registrar, I had sought a placement with a forensic psychiatrist, Angus Campbell, uh, who as many forensic psychiatrists did and as I would eventually uh, uh, do, uh, Angus Campbell did a session at Strange Ways Prison. And when the senior medical officer there uh, heard that uh, uh, I'd got a consultant post in Leeds, he asked me if he, uh, he could give my name to the senior medical officer at Arnley Prison in Leeds. Uh, and uh, I agreed to that. Uh, I was then in the slightly embarrassing position uh, of taking up an appointment, which was the, the clinical part of which was uh, uh, providing an ordinary general psychiatry service, along with a number of other uh, general psychiatrists to uh, the eastern part of Leeds, and providing a liaison psychiatry service to uh, St. James's University Hospital, which was then the largest teaching hospital in uh, uh, Europe, uh, uh, that would have been, uh, and indeed became for one of my successes, a full-time job in its own right. Uh, but uh, I was at the same time offered a session, uh, a half-day session at, uh, at Armley Prison. And I, I was very fortunate that my academic boss, uh, Professor Andrew Sims, uh, uh, took a very broad view of uh, liaison psychiatry and said, well, you know, in the, in, in the broader sense of the word, it's a form of liaison psychiatry, I think you should do it. And at the same time, there was a senior registrar uh, leaving Leeds who had started uh, providing uh, reports uh, in defence cases for a particular firm of uh, solicitors. Uh, I think it was Barrington Black and Company. Barrington Black went on to become a stipendiary magistrate in London and uh, then went on to the, um, at the bench at the Old Bailey. Uh, he asked if he could give my name to uh, uh, Barrington Black. And so I had at one and the same time uh, uh, prosecution instructions uh, through uh, the uh, newly established Crown Prosecution Service and the senior medical officer at the prison and defence uh, instructions uh, from this one uh, particular firm. And as uh, many expert witnesses will uh, uh, testify, uh, uh, you only need about one report to establish yourself. Uh, I think my first re uh, criminal report for Barrington Black was, uh, was with someone who had schizophrenia. Uh, and uh, within weeks, uh, a barrister uh, uh, who had presumably read my report recommended me to another firm uh, as being uh, the expert on schizophrenia. Uh, and I think it was also uh, that same firm of solicitors uh, through which Eventually, my name was given to uh, someone who was doing personal injury cases, and I got my first uh, set of instructions in a civil case. That, that process of how one becomes an expert is interesting in itself, isn't it? That's perhaps another story. So you started working in prisons quite some time ago. When, when was it precisely? Uh, it was 1983 when I... Um, uh, became visiting consultant at uh, uh, at uh, Armley Prison, and I kept that up until about two thousand and sixteen. So, did you see much change over that time? Uh, 
yes, uh, enormous changes. Uh, I just see if I can write down what uh, uh, some of them were. Uh, oh. I, the, um, I suppose the most significant change was the uh, development of um, prison inreach teams. At the beginning, uh, uh, the, the system simply depended on there being a number of uh, consultants going in. Mm. Armley, of course, being a very large uh, prison, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, almost every morning and every afternoon uh, th there was a consultant psychiatrist there, many of them, uh, uh, of course, uh, being consultants from the regional secure unit uh, in Wakefield. And I think for a while uh, uh, I was probably the only uh, consultant going in who wasn't uh, from the regional uh, secure unit. I would take uh, with me my uh, senior registrar and also uh, my senior house officer or registrar. So in, in fact, uh, it was a team of, of usually uh, three uh, people, but entirely uh, medical. Uh, now uh, prison in reach teams have, uh, as of course they should have, uh, the, the full range uh, of mental health uh, uh, professionals. Uh, the, the second change is the, uh, is the one to which I've already alluded, and that is uh, the, uh, the way that uh, uh, visiting experts uh, are no, long, no longer enjoy that uh, hospitality. Uh, I, I use that in, in the uh, in, a, in a very professional sense, that hospitality uh, in the uh, hospital wing, as it used to be uh, now, the uh, uh, healthcare uh, centre. Um, oh, I suppose uh, one important point to make, uh, and rather sad to make this point, uh, is that. Uh, uh, when people uh, would hear that I was going into prison, and I'm reminded of, uh, uh, of when my oldest uh, daughter started school and uh, my wife was shunned at the school gates until eventually uh, uh, one mother came up uh, and uh, 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 said, uh, uh, I hope it's all right talking to you about this. We understand things may be difficult to understand um, of Virginia's dad's in prison. Uh, uh, but people uh, would say to me, um, uh, don't you feel uh, uh, you're in danger in prison? And I would uh, say in those days, I actually feel safer uh, uh, carrying out assessments in prison uh, than I do in some of the uh, psychiatric wards that I go to. Uh, or, of course, uh, carrying out assessments in uh, patients' uh, patients' homes. Um, sadly, uh, uh, although, as I say, I've not been involved as a visiting consultant for uh, 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 since about I think it was probably two thousand and forty. Uh, what I've heard from my colleagues uh, who do go into prisons uh, these days. Uh, is that they uh, they do feel uh, uh, frightened. They don't feel that they've got the protection and the support uh, uh, of the prison staff, which uh, is of course quite critical to uh, the safety and well-being uh, of uh, of visiting healthcare professionals. So it should also make a difference to the quality of the assessment as well, because if you don't feel safe, there's certain questions that you might really need to ask, but may be fearful of asking in, in case the person experiences that as provocative, might they? Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, uh, I mean, I, just, 
uh, in, in, ter in terms of uh, in terms of feeling safe. Uh, I, I remember once using the senior medical officer's uh, room in army prison. Uh, I hadn't used it before. He was away, and uh, 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 I was uh, uh, sitting uh, on the opposite side of his desk, not the way that I would organise a, a room for a medical legal consultation if I was in charge of the arrangement of the furniture. Uh, the prisoner was on the other side of the desk. Uh, he was uh, nearest nearer the door, uh, which of course uh, you, you, you wouldn't do if you planned it properly. Um, and all of a sudden the, uh, uh, the alarm uh, went off and we, we looked at each other uh, with some anxiety. And, uh, and then immediately the, the door flew open. Uh, prison officers rushed in and grabbed my, uh, my prisoner. And what had happened was that uh, the uh, SMO uh, had a, uh, a, a sort of office chair on wheels. And I'd been doing what I can do on this one, wheeling myself about, not realizing that uh, 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 just close to my knee was the alarm button. And of course, I pressed the alarm uh, 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 button. Uh, and the prisoners, the prison officers were actually coming to my rescue. Yes. So um, and just thinking about the comment that you made earlier on about not being permitted the same kind of hospitality when you went in, I didn't quite understand why why that was. Why was it that you couldn't use healthcare facilities? Uh, I've never got to the uh, 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 to the bottom of this. Uh, at one time, uh, I know that it had something to do with uh, a distinction that was made between experts for the uh, instructed uh, by the prosecution and experts instructed by the defence. Uh, and there was a time when, if you were instructed by the prosecution, uh, you could go and see the person in the healthcare centre and you could read their medical records. And if you're instructed by the defence, you had the feeling that, uh, uh, that they were out to make things as difficult for you uh, as possible. Uh, and that was at a time when uh, I think that people who had uh, power and influence within the prison uh, system uh, did not understand uh, the uh, ethical uh, basis of expert witness practice, uh, which is that uh, the expert owes their duty uh, to the court, is to give independent and impartial evidence, regardless of who instructs them. Mm. Uh, but um, uh, the, uh, one did sense in those early days uh, an attitude on the part uh, uh, of some prison uh, medical officers that uh, the, the experts who came in and assessed the prisoners for the defence were in some way their adversaries and that they were, uh, and because the prison medical officers also did uh, 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 reports for the prosecution, uh, they were usually in serious cases, uh, two reports, one by the visiting psychiatrist one by the prison medical officer. Um, uh, one had the feeling that, that, that they saw uh, their, their role uh, as being to ensure that, as it were, the prosecution case would, uh, would stick rather than uh, simply assisting the court uh, with an exposition uh, of the uh, facts that were beyond the comprehension of the court uh, and an opinion which uh, uh, could only be given on those facts by uh, an appropriately uh, uh, trained professional. Mm, thank you. So you also used to do quite a lot of family work, as I understand it. Yes. And I was thinking that both prison and family 
court work carry a high risk of complaint to pro professionals. And I've thought in my own role periodically through my career that the kind of work that we do carries you know, a burden of risk that we're exposed and vulnerable. And you must have been in just that kind of position for most of your career, I should think. Is it something you've encountered at all in your career? It is. Uh, very early on, uh, I remember two uh, murder cases in which the defendants, uh, the tariffs set upon their conviction uh, uh, for murder, and in one case, uh, a rape as well as murder, were clearly influenced, as the judge uh, made plain, uh, by my risk assessment. And uh, uh, one of those uh, uh, prisoners, uh, I remember hearing shout from the dock, um, I'm going to kill that effing Dr. Ricks when I get out of here. And something similar, I understand, said uh, in another case. Uh, by then, uh, I had already made sure that uh, my phone number was ex-directory, uh, that uh, I uh, had successfully applied to uh, be anonymized on the electoral uh, register and, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, as the years went by, and I realized that these men and perhaps others uh, were reaching uh, their tariff dates or whatever you call the date at which they become eligible for parole, that uh, there might be people out there uh, who had a, a grudge against me. Uh, family work uh, does generate uh, well articulated complaints sometimes. And uh, I had a complaint uh, made against me, uh, which it took two and a half years uh, for the General Medical Council to uh, decide that there was no uh, reason to put me before a fitness to practice uh, panel. It's a very long time to be sat with that anxiety, isn't it? It is. And the mistake that I made uh, was not to uh, tell any of my professional colleagues. I had uh, professional indemnity insurance uh, through my medical defence organisation, the Medical and Dental Defence Union of Scotland. Uh, so I had the legal uh, uh, support that I needed through the MDD US. But the only people who knew about uh, the complaint uh, were my wife, uh, my three daughters and their partners, uh, husbands, and of course, uh, my uh, uh, personal uh, assistant. Uh, and although I wouldn't or didn't or couldn't admit it at the time, uh, my wife subsequently uh, convinced me that I did become depressed uh, over that period of time. Uh, in those days, uh, I think that the, the peer group system uh, that is now uh, very well established within the Royal College of Psychiatrists was probably still only in its early days. And um, I'm uh, involved in a peer group uh, uh, in which uh, colleagues can share uh, similar uh, concerns uh, with the uh, rest of us. We can support uh, each other when something like this uh, comes along. And I wouldn't want uh, uh, viewers or listeners uh, to this podcast to be deterred uh, either by uh, what I said about the threats from uh, 
uh, those two men in criminal cases, uh, or by what uh, I just said about uh, complaints in, uh, in family uh, cases. Uh, uh, I now recognize that uh, if you're going to do expert witness work, you're going to get complaints because, uh, and in particular, uh, in, in family cases where uh, litigants in person uh, do not uh, understand in the same way as instructing solicitors do, that the expert's uh, uh, duty is to the court and not to the, uh, uh, not to the instructing party. Um, uh, since uh, I had that complaint, I, I've had two more, I've shared them with colleagues. Uh, uh, they they were resolved much more uh, uh, much more quickly uh, than that uh, uh, first one was, and uh, I've you know I, I I took those in my in in my stride again two that uh, that were completely uh, un, uh, unfounded, but nevertheless uh, cause anxiety at the time. So the important things are. Uh, in relation to complaints are, first of all, you must have indemnity insurance uh, uh, in place. Uh, and uh, uh, and what well, perhaps I say equally important, uh, not just not secondly, but uh, uh, peer support, uh, both uh, uh, professional peer support uh, and the support that uh, you can get from uh, a, a partner or your family. Thank you. That's a really helpful um, uh, description, really, of, of what can be a, a very burden burdensome yeah, experience as one feels the kind of structures that one imagined were there to help and support one, you know, professional bodies and uh, friends and uh, supporters how they can melt away in the culture of secrecy. And importantly, you're describing the kind of structures that one can build into one's own life and practice, which, which uh, enable one to move through these, uh, these experiences. So thanks for that. You've, you've worked also as an expert witness in cases where there's been a push really for a death penalty. What was that like? Well, um, in all but one of those cases, uh, there was no actual uh, push. All but one of those cases were in the uh, in the uh, Caribbean, uh, in Grenada, where uh, it was decades since uh, anyone had actually uh, been. Uh, executed um, following uh, the passing of a death sentence. Uh, and in Trinidad, where there was no immediate uh, risk uh, of uh, execution, but where uh, there was a risk that a government uh, might, from time to time, think it was in uh, its interests to take some people from death row and uh, uh, have them executed. Uh, so those uh, cases, although they were uh, very demanding uh, cases for a, a number of reasons, uh, the, uh, the importance of understanding uh, the culture and society within which these people lived and within which their crimes were committed in some cases, uh, uh, language and uh, dialect uh, uh, difficulties. Uh, and then uh, the need to come to grips with a different legal system, both in terms of the, the, uh, their statutory laws and their, uh, and their procedures. Uh, but, uh, and, and I remember when I first uh, uh, rejected uh, an invitation to take such cases, 
um, I, I was asked if I would take on these cases by uh, uh, Edward Fitzgerald uh, at QC, uh, uh, probably one of the uh, most prominent uh, criminal defence uh, uh, barristers uh, uh, around today. And uh, I remember saying to him that uh, although I did murder cases and uh, I was confident that I could give opinions which would make a difference between uh, a conviction uh, for murder with the mandatory life sentence and a conviction of, uh, for diminished responsibility manslaughter, which opens up the whole range of sentencing options for a judge. I didn't feel confident that about my uh, opinion uh, uh, in a case uh, where there might be the imposition uh, uh, of, the, of the death penalty. Some, uh, some years later, uh, having already been doing cases in the, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, I actually heard Edward Fitzgerald shout my name across the reception area in the Royal Courts of Justice and it words along the lines of, I want you to go to Botswana. And uh, within about 10 days, I was in Botswana. Uh, in a case that uh, uh, about which the uh, BBC uh, made a film that they called, I think it was the Botswana Love Triangle uh, Murder. And uh, that was an interesting experience because uh, I suspect that uh, obstacles were put in my way to prevent me from assessing uh, uh, this woman. Uh, I was meant to have my uh, medical credentials uh, checked by somebody like the Minister of Health before I went to the uh, prison, uh, a little bit like uh, having the, the equivalent of GMC uh, registration uh, for uh, a different country. But he didn't turn up uh, on the Monday morning. Uh, uh, I was told that the reason was that uh, he was doing the school run. Uh, but the woman solicitor uh, uh, then told me that uh, he was allowed to take in uh, uh, someone. Uh, I think it was a doctor uh, or a priest. And so he took me in anyway, and I assessed the woman. And uh, the following day, my wife and I uh, interviewed uh, her daughters. Uh, we eventually got back uh, to England on the Wednesday night, I think it was. I spent the Thursday and Friday drafting my report, uh, finalising it following discussion with Edward Fitzgerald uh, on the Saturday, and with a view to it uh, being put before the court first thing on the uh, on the Monday morning. Now on the Monday morning, uh, the, the woman's family went as they usually did to visit her. And instead of being allowed into the prison on the Monday morning, uh, they were handed a black bin bag uh, with her belongings uh, and informed that uh, she had been executed uh, the, on the Friday morning. And it turned out that the president uh, who was actually in London on the Friday for a conference about the diamond trade, uh, had signed the death warrant uh, on, I think it was the Tuesday, uh, before he uh, uh, left for, uh, uh, for London. Now, uh, we knew uh, because uh, Botswana uh, did carry out the death penalty, that there was uh, an average length of time, obviously, between uh, uh, when uh, the uh, 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 when sentence was given and when the sentence was carried out. 
and we thought that uh, we were uh, that we had time to get my report before the court uh, with a view to a stay of execution. Uh, but uh, it seems almost certain that the uh, that when uh, the government realised that I was there and that uh, I was going to be in a position to uh, deliver my report within a week or so, uh, that uh, her execution was brought forward. Um, and uh, it may well be that uh, if it hadn't been brought forward, that uh, that uh, she would still uh, have been uh, hanged. Um, she was the first white woman uh, to be executed in post-colonial uh, Botswana. And what we were uh, told by um, professional people we met when we were there was that uh, uh, the um, government uh, uh, would certainly not make an, an exception for a white woman uh, when it had uh, been uh, in the practice uh, of, of hanging uh, black women over a number of years. That's a very uh, shocking story, really. It must have been a terrible uh, experience and, and shows how vulnerable the uh, ju judicial system is to some of the uh, goings on in a political system. Yes. Yeah, horrible, um, horrible sense of burden that could have left you with as well. Um, yes, linking uh, the two events. I, I should say that uh, you know I, I've made a number of assumptions there about what uh, happened. Some of which uh, I think are probably borne out by the BBC TV uh, program. Uh, but again, talking about the burden uh, brings me back to um, where my wife uh, fits into it and. Uh, I'm not sure uh, whether it was before uh, that trip to Botswana, but certainly after, would, uh, w when she would talk about the, uh, the way that we work together, uh, that she referred to it as, uh, as riding shotgun uh, when I uh, took on these cases. Yeah, must have, um, it must have touched both of you that, that trip, I think. Yes. What are some of the ethical issues that expert witnesses face in the UK? The, the one which comes at the top of the list uh, is the temptation to be a hired gun. And uh, There are, unfortunately, uh, even though particularly in the um, uh, civil justice field, uh, Lord Wolfe's uh, recommendations for reform, which resulted in, I think it was in 1999 or perhaps 1997 in the uh, uh, civil um, procedure rules, uh, the, although uh, as a result uh, of their implementation, uh, many uh, uh, hired guns have, as it were, been driven out of town. There are still uh, hired guns, and it doesn't matter whether I talk to an obstetrician expert, a neurologist expert, a psychologist expert, uh, they will all be able to name two or three uh, of their colleagues uh, who act as hired, uh, hired guns. And I think in addition to those uh, who uh, do act in that way, uh, with a degree of uh, how shall I put it? Um, uh, with with, uh, with insight into what they're doing, uh, there is a problem for all experts 
of um, unconscious uh, bias and therefore of uh, a need to uh, take steps to avoid uh, being influenced uh, by what you know are the interests of the uh, instructing party. Uh, bias is something that uh, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to write about uh, with the late uh, Professor Nigel Eastman, uh, uh, one of the um, leading uh, forensic uh, psychiatrists uh, at the end of the last century and the beginning of this century, who uh, sadly died earlier this year. Uh, uh, I've been fortunate to work with him uh, in writing the guidelines for the Royal College of Psychiatrists uh, on the duties and responsibilities of the expert witness. But uh, uh, over about 10 years, as our paths uh, uh, more converged more and more, uh, we wrote a number of uh, papers. And the last one we wrote, uh, published in uh, the journal BJ Psych Advances, uh, was, on, uh, was on bias. Thank you. And you've, got, you've contributed a lot to the skill of being an expert witness over the years. So in addition to, to, um, to that document there, you've edited two texts on the subject. You've been very actively involved in court-based networking. What advice would you give to someone starting out as an expert witness? What qualities are needed? How do potential experts get involved? First of all, the advice. And the first piece of advice is to uh, get proper training as uh, an expert witness. It doesn't matter how expert uh, you are in the field of psychiatry, psychology, obstetrics, midwifery, or whatever. Uh, more than uh, that is needed if you are going to assist the, uh, the courts. So uh, number one is, uh, is, is training. The second piece of advice uh, is to uh, fiercely uh, defend your independence and not be afraid to say to those instructing you, uh, do bear in mind that uh, uh, I am not uh, part of your team, uh, or if I'm part of the team, remember that I owe my allegiance to the court, not to you and not to your, uh, not to your client. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, things that will happen in the course of a case uh, which may require the experts to assert their independence. So number one, uh, get training as an expert. Number two, uh, be fiercely independent. And number three is actually get retraining. Uh, if you don't uh, repeat your training at intervals, there's a risk that uh, uh, you drift. Um, it's not just a case of keeping, uh, keeping up to date. Uh, it's, it's more than that. The qualities that are needed uh, are uh, an obsessional attention to detail. And I'm fortunate uh, in having a rather obsessional personality. Secondly, what I've already said, the uh, ability to uh, be fiercely uh, independent. Thirdly, uh, and I think that clinicians uh, either have this or acquire it, but sometimes it needs to be uh, 
how shall I put it? Uh, um, nurtured, and that is the uh, ability to empathize uh, with people who uh, many people in society would uh, regard as in some way uh, objectionable uh, and so on. Some of the most difficult cases uh, will be uh, the assessment uh, of people who have offended against children. And it's inevitable that uh, the health professional uh, who has children or nephews and nieces uh, uh, or whatever uh, will uh, feel a sense of uh, repulsion but be repulsed uh, by what has been done. Don't be repulsed by the, uh, by the person. Um, and I think there are some other uh, uh, categories uh, of subjects of reports where there, there may be a little difficulty in uh, empathizing. And although it's not a quality, uh, what the expert has to keep in mind all the time uh, is that uh, this is about uh, justice. It's about uh, making sure that if a child is being removed uh, from the parents, that uh, in the long run, uh, that is going to be uh, for the best. Uh, it's about um, uh, making sure that uh, the person with some mental disorder or mental vulnerability who falls foul of the law uh, gets not only uh, justice uh, in the sense uh, of what such wrongdoing uh, should attract, but uh, has a sentence that enables them to uh, receive as good uh, health care uh, as they would uh, if they had not uh, offended. Really good advice for all forensic work, isn't it? And it, I suppose it draws to mind Dominic Raab's comments from last week um, about uh, Baby P's mother um, and wanting to intervene in the process of her release because of her acts of evil. But um, one of our guests that we've had on and due on again in the, in the very near future, Professor Rob Canton, writes about the role that disgust plays within the criminal justice system yes. and that uh, you know Dominic Raab's comments seem to be more driven by disgust than an understanding of the risk factors and it, as an expert witness you can't afford to allow your disgust at the the acts that have occurred to intervene interfere in that process can you, you have to be able to objective and to be able yes. to see the vulnerability of the the person who may have done some disgusting things um, in order to really get to grips with what the true nature of the risk is. Yes, uh, I mean, it's, to paraphrase what I said, it's uh, be disgusted by what they've done, but to don't be disgusted by the person. Yeah. I just want to pop in there and pick up a couple of things that you've just said. Firstly, you, you highlighted the importance of having a good training. Um, and then you'd also mentioned Nigel Eastman. Um, and I worked with uh, Nigel when he was doing his psychiatric uh, rotation uh, in Oxford so quite a long time ago and he came to the unit that I was working on the Ashurst uh, clinic and so I rem we probably should have got him on the podcast but we missed that opportunity but I remember him as being a very bright very lively chap who brought to every case a legal uh, perspective because of course he had been well still was um, a, a lawyer um, and 
that, that impressed me. It could be slightly irritating because he always had this legal <laughs> view on on uh, anybody. Um, but it was a really good lesson for me to try and understand that there's always a number of other perspectives on any given situation. Yes, Nigel um, uh, uh, was a barrister, uh, but as his reports would have in brackets, non, uh, non-practicing. And uh, I, I was enormously stimulated by uh, the, the legal perspective which he would have on many of the topics with which we, we have had to, uh, uh, to grapple. Uh, and uh, so far as advice is concerned, uh, I would say that uh, training uh, could and should, for many expert witnesses, ex- extend to doing a law degree. Um, I did a, a Master of Laws in Medical Law and Ethics at De Montfort uh, University, and that was extremely valuable because uh, although many psychiatrists uh, uh, do a Master of Laws in Mental Health Law, uh, the great thing about the De Montfort uh, course uh, was that uh, it, there were a number of modules that were relevant to expert witness practice. Uh, the two, mo- the two uh, clinical malpractice modules uh, informed not only uh, uh, my work in cases of alleged uh, clinical negligence, but also uh, informed uh, uh, my uh, work uh, for the professional regulators. In fact, uh, I chose for my dissertation the um, fitness to practice procedures of the uh, of the uh, GMC. I was at that time a, a chairman of the fitness to practice panel. There was obviously the uh, the mental health module with its emphasis on uh, criminal law. There was a module on capacity and uh, consent. And just after uh, I was about to finish, they introduced an expert uh, evidence uh, module. And uh, I know that that, uh, that course is still uh, running. Um, it, it included a special study uh, module. Uh, this was very attractive because instead of having to uh, write, as it were, an essay uh, on a topic that you are given by your uh, uh, lecturers. Uh, you write your own uh, essay title. Uh, so I, uh, for my special study module, chose the, the role of uh, medical practitioners in uh, capital punishment. So that sounds like a, a really interesting course. I've not heard about that before. People often talk about doing bond so long training don't they is um, yes. to get started in expert witness but are there any other ways that potential experts can get involved how would you I, I know there's a bit of a shortage of experts certainly in family courts how yeah. how how do people get started if, if somebody if any of our listeners were interested in getting involved how would they go about this yes uh, for many of them uh, this next piece of advice will be uh, uh, too late but uh, I am firmly of the view that in, in those uh, of our health professionals where we have a, a system of hierarchical uh, training, that uh, training as an expert witness uh, should be gained uh, in one of the training grades. So for uh, medical practitioners, that means that uh, they, should have, they should get their uh, experience first of all when they're a specialty registrar and either the consultant for whom they're attached for training uh, or another to whom they can get a secondment is doing expert witness work again going back to uh, Nigel Eastman uh, we put together some suggestions of 
uh, as to how that would work out in, in detailed practice in one of our papers for BJ, uh, BJ Psych Advances. Courses, uh, uh, you mentioned Bond Solon. Uh, I did the Bond Solon training around about 1992. And if you look at the, uh, the quality of my uh, reports over the years, uh, you've got a steady uh, increase in uh, quality uh, that uh, was partly down to learning by mistake, by my mistakes. But then when you get to 1991, uh, all of a sudden uh, the line uh, goes upwards. Uh, I learned so much from those two days of uh, of bond at so long training. One day was report writing. Uh, I think I was probably the only medic in the room, uh, but you can learn so much from uh, uh, other experts. The second day was about uh, giving uh, oral testimony. And then there are two expert witness bodies that provide training. And I would encourage any um, aspiring experts to seek uh, uh, what I think is called provisional membership uh, of either the Academy of Experts uh, or the Expert uh, Witness Institute. Although a small, uh, often local peer group, having said that, I'm conscious of the fact that my own medical legal peer group, uh, I, I've never met them in person. Uh, we only got together at the beginning of COVID and uh, we meet online. But uh, uh, as, as well as having a local peer group, uh, what uh, bodies like the Expert Witness Institute and uh, the Academy of Experts do, and also bond so long through their annual conference, is to give uh, experts the opportunity to meet each other, not only for the formal presentations that, uh, of course, are so important for keeping up to date, but to to meet and mingle informally and uh, uh, discuss uh, uh, what, what they're doing. So uh, formal expert witness training, uh, which could eventually, as I say, lead on to doing uh, uh, a master's degree uh, in one of these uh, areas or uh, what Bon Solon uh, offers, which is its um, through its link with Cardiff University, what they call its uh, CUBS certificate, and then to uh, obtain uh, some form of certification. The Expert Witness Institute now has a, a certification uh, a program. All of these uh, ensure that uh, the expert is surrounded by other experts, that there are opportunities uh, to learn from more experienced experts, but you can also uh, learn from inexperienced uh, experts. Uh, it's a bit like what I've always said uh, in my practice of psychiatry, that uh, the day I stop learning from my junior doctor is the day when I ought to uh, retire. How do the challenges involved in expert witness work compare with those of being a psychiatrist more generally, Keith? you uh, are much more conscious of the need to rely on evidence and to be able to give reasons for what, uh, what you say. Uh, the, an expert report, uh, although sometimes it may be limited to uh, helping uh, the court uh, understand facts that are beyond the uh, observation and uh, description uh, of the layperson. Uh, most expert reports are uh, contain an opinion, but those opinions are of no use to the court unless uh, they are properly reasoned. It's the old uh, uh, adage uh, from arithmetic at school, show us your workings. 
and uh, the skill of the expert uh, is to do just that. Uh, the skill is only to put into the body of the report those facts which uh, will in some way uh, be woven into the reasoning behind the uh, behind the opinion. Uh, similarity that is of some significance. And uh, I can illustrate this uh, by referring to uh, uh, literally uh, bumping into uh, my old professor from Edinburgh where I did my higher training. Sorry, not, not my higher training, where I did my uh, SHO and registrar training, Professor Bob uh, Kendall. And uh, I hadn't had much to do with him after I left uh, uh, Edinburgh, uh, but he knew that I'd gone uh, into forensic uh, psychiatry. And uh, I bumped into him one day on the Euston Road. I think he'd been staying at the Royal College of Physicians. And uh, he told me about a colleague uh, of his, someone who had a South African psychiatrist who had trained with him uh, at the Maudsley Hospital. And uh, subsequently, uh, this psychiatrist had been imprisoned uh, and uh, uh, if not tortured, certainly uh, had been uh, interrogated and so on in a South African uh, prison. And this psychiatrist meeting Kendall uh, some years later said to him, uh, that was nothing like uh, a case conference chaired by Sir Aubrey Lewis. And th there is a system within psychiatry that uh, I think the psychologists uh, will probably have come across. I know that we used to have uh, the, the psychologists and as along with social workers and all the other health professionals would attend uh, the weekly case conferences that we had in uh, Manchester that were chaired either uh, by uh, Professor Neil Kessel uh, or by Professor later Sir uh, David Goldberg. Uh, now those were modeled on the Maudsley uh, case conference uh, that uh, in the days when people like uh, Kendall and Goldberg were junior doctors, case conferences chaired by uh, Sir Aubrey Lewis. And my own experience uh, of uh, presenting a case uh, to either Professor Kendall or Professor Walton uh, in Edinburgh when I was a senior house officer or, or and registrar, and of uh, having to do one just to show that I knew how to do it when I got to Manchester and I was uh, a lecturer uh, uh, presenting to either Kessel or Goldberg. Uh, what is required uh, uh, of the uh, psychiatric trainee in that setting uh, is exactly what is required in the expert uh, report. You have to know all of the uh, literature and if you haven't read all of the papers relevant to that particular case, you can be sure that, uh, uh, that Kessel or Goldberg would have uh, read them and uh, that will be pointed out uh, to your uh, embarrassment in front of all of your uh, peers. Uh, you'll be asked for reasons for your uh, uh, diagnosis. Uh, you'll be asked, uh, uh, well, not you'll be asked, but other uh, consultants attending the case conference will say, well, you know, okay, your diagnosis is X, mine is Y, mine is Z. And you have to be able to uh, justify your diagnosis in the face uh, of the suggestions that uh, it's not X, but uh, it's Y or Z. And in exactly the same way, uh, when you're preparing an expert uh, report, uh, yes, your opinion is X, but the expert has to give the range of reasonable opinion. And when uh, sometimes, I think I've written about it in this way, 
uh, when you're thinking about the range of reasonable opinion, uh, think about the opinions that would be given in that case if you were presenting it at a Maudsley style uh, 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 case conference. And think not only about the uh, opinions that are given by the, the reasonable colleagues who would attend, but think also about the opinions that might be given by the unreasonable ones. I think, that's, I think that's good advice. I think um, mental health review tribunals and parole boards also a good good places, aren't they, to build up skills which um, yes. stand you in good stead if you're actually in, in more of a formal court procedure, procedure. So I'm conscious of the time and the fact that I know that courts are waiting on you. Uh, so I've just take us to our last question, which is about how the friends at work and court work is often immensely challenging. How have you managed to keep yourself psychologically healthy over so many years of doing this kind of like emotionally burdensome work? Yes. Uh, well, the first thing is a, a very fulfilling uh, marriage to a very uh, supportive uh, wife. Uh, I suppose it's helped that, uh, that she uh, uh, was a health professional uh, when I met her, uh, the nursing sister on the coronary care unit around the corner from where I was doing my first uh, uh, a house job as a house physician. Uh, supportive and interested uh, uh, daughters and indeed also their, uh, their, their partners. So um, I'm not saying that uh, you can't be an expert if you're a single person and uh, uh, have, no, have no children, uh, but uh, uh, have, having a supportive partner and family uh, that comes first. Uh, second is having uh, things to do, uh, things to stimulate the mind and to, to relax that are outside of uh, expert witness uh, work. So for me, uh, it's bird watching, uh, not so much hill walking uh, in uh, a part of Norfolk, which does have some hills, but uh, not the sort that, on which I used to walk in there. Uh, uh, in Scotland uh, and uh, recreation with, uh, with, with music, uh, in particular uh, opera and jazz. And sometimes those can come together. Uh, I should have also said 1960s music because sometimes I will uh, put a CD on over uh, uh, on, on, the, on the other side and uh, actually listen to music while I'm uh, uh, preparing a report. I